One region that's on many individuals' bucket lists is French Polynesia. Taking a cruise that goes to Tahiti and Bora Bora, along with the other islands in the region, is one of those dream vacations. But is it really all that's cracked up to be? Well, we just returned from a seven-night Dreams of Tahiti cruise with Windstar Cruises and want to share all the details with you. From our experiences on the ship to time spent ashore, we cover it all in our exclusive Windstar Cruises Tahiti Cruise Review. Welcome aboard, cruisers. I'm DB from Eat Sleep Cruise, where we help you plan the perfect cruise vacation so you can see the world one port at a time. And one destination many individuals have on their bucket list is Tahiti. Of course, it was on our bucket list, so when we had the opportunity to take a cruise in the region, of course, we said yes. We were fortunate enough to get on one of the ships that has just been updated as part of the cruise line's Star Plus initiative. So in this review, we'll discuss what it was like sailing on the vessel, as well as let you know what it was like visiting each port of call. Of course, if you have any questions at all about Windstar Cruises, about cruising Tahiti, or any of the destinations, please leave them in the comment section below and we'll make sure to answer them. So let's start the review by taking a look at the vessel itself, Windstar Cruises Star Breeze. Now, if you're more interested in learning about the different ports of call, fast forward to the 12 minute mark, where I begin talking about each of the different destinations starting with the home port, Papietti, Tahiti. Now, as I mentioned, this ship was the first to undergo the Star Plus initiative. So as part of this update, Starbreeze was lengthened and received a number of new suites, venues, and improvements. Now, Starbreeze weighs in at just under 13,000 gross tons and has a total of eight decks. For a ship of its size, there were adequate outdoor spaces for cruisers to enjoy during this Tahiti cruise. Unlike big mega ships, Windstar Cruises focuses on delivering more intimate experiences and destination focused itineraries, with the onboard experience giving cruisers just exactly what they need so they can have a luxurious time on board while being immersed in the regions the ships visit. On Star Breeze, there's a pool and hot tub on Deck 7 that never seem too busy at any time of day. There are also plenty of loungers on the pool deck to relax and enjoy the views. One deck above, is an uncovered sun deck. It's also home to the outdoor bar, the Star Bar. There's some comfy outdoor furniture on the forward port side of this deck. It's an ideal place to relax, read a book, or sip a cocktail from the bar after a long day ashore. While there's no official jogging track on the ship, we often saw cruisers using this deck to get some morning exercise before heading to that day's port of call. Another hidden gem on Star Breeze is located on deck five all the way forward. This tucked away outdoor space includes some loungers and a whirlpool that overlooks the front of the ship. Finally, there's a water sports platform on deck 13 aft. The signature at Windstar Cruise attraction is open most days while the ship is tendered. Activities there include the use of kayaks, snorkeling equipment, a water trampoline, wakeboards, and even Zodiac boats. Now we tried to utilize this deck a couple times but it just happened to be closed early due to the sea conditions on those particular afternoons. One benefit of small ship cruising is the personal level of experience on board. It didn't take long for staff members from different departments to recognize us. It started with Martina and the destinations team who would check us in for our tours as soon as we entered the lounge. Annabella at the reception desk could anticipate our questions or requests after the first day. Jeffrey in the Yacht Club knew our morning coffee order after a few mornings. In terms of bar service, Marcella in the Compass Rose, Ace and Noel in the Dining Room, and Mr. T in the Star Bar, just to name a few, knew our drink orders and had them ready quickly. Our stateroom attendant, Afrin, was attentive and friendly. He made up our room daily with precision timing and made a daily animal towel without us requesting it. He even decorated our suite for my birthday. Service in the restaurants was also friendly and attentive, but with open seating, we never had the same wait staff. So we did not really get to know these team members as well. Finally, even the ship's officers were visible throughout the cruise. From walking around the hallways to partaking in the events of the signature deck party, the officers were always ready to strike up a conversation with guests. Honestly, this is probably the best service that we've had on a cruise ship in a long time. When it came to casual dining, the cruise ship's buffet veranda on deck seven was open for breakfast and lunch. The breakfast menu offers the predictable selections like scrambled eggs, bacon, toast, and some continental items. There's also made to order options like omelets, pancakes, and waffles. Likewise, for lunch, the venue had rotating selections. 
there was always a carving station featuring items like pork tenderloin or rotisserie chicken. Other options included international flavors, with some days featuring Asian cuisine, Mexican, and Italian dishes. There was also a custom salad station and a small apps bar. The grill was also open every day in the buffet, so you could order sandwiches like burgers or grilled chicken. So we never had an issue finding something to eat. Further, the Cruise Ships Cafe is located on Deck 8 in the Yacht Club. This venue was open from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and was our go-to for lattes and other espresso-based drinks. On Windstar Cruises, all non-alcoholic beverages are included in the cruise fare. This not only includes specialty coffees, but soda and bottled water. In addition to coffees, you can get breakfast pastries and other options like yogurt at the Yacht Club Cafe in the morning. And during the day, there are small bites like granola bars, pre-made sandwiches, cookies, and cupcakes. On deck three, you'll find the main dining room for Star Breeze. The venue is open for dinner five nights of the cruise. On night three, there was a signature deck party barbecue. And on night six, there was a destination discovery event. Thus, the main dining room was not open on those two evenings. For our cruise, the main dining room was open for dinner only. Breakfast and lunch were only served in the veranda during our cruise. Windstar Cruises has an open seating policy, so you don't need to make reservations at the main dining room. You are able to show up for dinner at any time between 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. Like other cruise lines, the three-course dining room menu does change nightly. Some featured items included beef tenderloin, veal au simboco, and even a lobster tail on the last night. We felt the entree selections were on par with other contemporary cruise lines. The food quality too also met our expectations. Most selections were warm and well seasoned, however we would have appreciated more selections for starters and desserts. Despite the limited offerings, I did really enjoy the crab cake, which was crispy and flavorful. In addition, we both raved about the crepe and the Grand Marnay souffle desserts. For dinner, Windstar Cruises offers three alternative dining options that are all included in your cruise fare. These are no upcharge specialty dining restaurants. Unfortunately though, one of the options, the Star Grill, was not open on this cruise due to limited capacity and COVID protocols. This outdoor venue restaurant features signature barbecue favorites from grill expert Steven Reichlin. The restaurant manager did indicate that once protocols are eased, this venue will be open most days for lunch and dinner with a rotating menu. The other two alternative restaurants, Quadro 44 and Candles, were open for dinner. Each night, the veranda's buffet transforms into one of these upscale dining venues. However, Quadro 44 does have its own intimate indoor space on the ship. Again, because of COVID protocols, the restaurant is currently sharing space with candles to allow for more outdoor seating. Quadro 44 is a Spanish tapas restaurant offering small plates and entrees bursting with spice and zest. From the pork belly to the grilled chorizo and the sweet and salty churros, the venue is best when shared with friends. On opposite nights, guests can dine at the cruise line Signature Steakhouse Candles at the same venue. This restaurant serves up quality steaks and seafood dishes. My 8 ounce filet was a juicy and tender medium rare, and the crispy onion rings and asparagus were the perfect side dishes. Reservations are required for these two specialty restaurants. We were able to make our reservations on embarkation day as part of the check-in process. We highly recommend that you do make reservations on the first day as these venues fill up quickly. Of note, room service is always available and complimentary on Windstar Cruises as well, with an all-day menu as well as the ability to get that night's main dining room menu delivered during dinner hours. We stayed in a suite on Deck 6, Cabin 631, which is considered an SBS1 category. The starboard side balcony cabin was located midship in the newly added section of the vessel. The star balcony suite was 277 square feet in size and included a French balcony. The suite was larger than most standard cabins on contemporary cruise lines. It featured a separate seating area with a love seat and coffee table, as well as two chairs and a small side table. There was also a mini bar, which is included when you offer Windstar's all-inclusive pricing option. I liked the setup of the cabin, which had the bed closer to the balcony. The forward wall on the front of the bed featured a desk and vanity and three large drawers that provided more storage. Another bonus of the Starbreeze suite was the walk-in closet. There were plenty of hangers and two clothes racks, a few small shelves, and a few drawers. This made organizing everything easy and simple. The bathroom too was upgraded when compared to a typical cruise cabin. It offered double sinks and a fully sized stand-up shower. This all-sweet ship 
gives cruisers the space and extra comfort, more akin to a hotel room rather than a typical cruise ship. While our suite did come with a balcony, it was only about a foot deep and three feet wide. So it was nice for taking photos and to allow some fresh air into the room, but you certainly could not relax outside on this balcony. When it comes to cruise ship activities, you're not going to find all the bells and whistles of a modern day mega ship on Wistar Cruises. Instead, Star Breeze was our elegant transportation between the ports of call. Our seven day cruise consisted of five different ports with one overnight in Bora Bora and no official sea days. With that being said, Star Breeze did offer some cruise ship activities in the afternoon like trivia or name that tune, in addition to the open water sports platform. Further, the ship's thermal suite was open all day. This complimentary area had heated loungers, a sauna, and a steam room. There was also an onboard fitness center open to all cruisers that includes some cardio equipment, some free weights, and Nautilus machines. In the Deck 8 Yacht Club, there were board games and some books to occupy your time. Of course, you could also just enjoy the views in this quiet, indoor space. As part of Windstar's signature experiences, the Streams of Tahiti Cruise did include an island beach barbecue and a private Motu one afternoon as well. Pre-dinner, there were daily port talks by the destinations manager. These featured a basic intro into the next stop, as well as info on available tours. There was also usually pre-dinner music by the duo Sky Blue. These talented performers could play anything from Frank Sinatra to Adele to Bruno Mars. In the evenings, there was either a show in the lounge or live music in the Compass Rose Bar. There were no headliners performing on the ship, so all shows featured the onboard band Queen of Aces and or the entertainment manager Steve. All of these performers were extremely talented, but of course, we would have liked a little bit more diversity for entertainment. There were three signature shows during our cruise, a Beatles tribute, a Melton John tribute, and a show entitled Songs We Wish We Had Written, which featured the vocal talents of the duo, entertainment manager, and all members of the band. Our seven night Dreams of Tahiti cruise was a round trip cruise from Papiati, Tahiti. With over 17 hours of travel time from Boston to Tahiti, we booked a two day pre-cruise day at the Intercontinental Tahiti. Of course, the wife insisted that we upgrade the typical accommodations to an overwater bungalow. With the time changes and our flight schedule, we arrived late Tuesday night for our Thursday cruise. So in all honesty, we only had one full day in Tahiti pre-cruise. And of course, you can explore the island on your own or book private tours. But with picture perfect weather and mid 80 degree temperatures, it was pretty easy for us just to relax in our overwater bungalow for this pre-cruise day. The private bungalow offered direct access to the ocean, so I was in heaven swimming in between some work and exploration of the resort. Honestly, the intercontinental felt pretty empty, so we were able to wander the entire property and take in the lush backdrop of the seaside resort with little crowds. With a few happy hour drinks, dinner at the casual restaurant, and a beautiful sunset, that full pre-cruise day was an early night for us. Now on the back end, we actually had a late day flight from Tahiti as well. And we know some other cruisers went and explored Papietti, the downtown area, and took a tour. We actually headed back to Intercontinental for a day pass. Our first day of the cruise, the ship was docked in Tahiti till about 6 p.m. So we spent the day exploring the ship, going through all the public venues, as well as testing out the main dining room for dinner and the live music in the Compass Rose that evening. On day two of our cruise, the first stop was Morea. Like many of the ports of call, we actually tendered at this location. The ship was anchored in Cook's Bay, which gives you some amazing views right from the outdoor decks. We booked a tour through Windstar Cruises, the island tour with Belvedere Lookout. It seemed like the most comprehensive introduction to the island and French Polynesian culture and history. With an early meeting time in the lounge, we were ashore by 8.30. Our small mini bus had about 15 people, so it was a perfect size tour. Tom, our tour guide, spent the next four hours showing us all the main highlights of the second most populated island in the Society Islands. Tom was actually originally from California, but married a Tahitian woman and had been living in Morea for about 17 years. So he had plenty of knowledge to offer regarding the history as well as modern day living. He provided just the right mix of facts and folklore with a natural delivery that made him engaging and easy to follow. During the tour, there were several stops at the island's bays as well as coastline stops and several viewpoints. 
which allow us to get some great shots of the landscape. Among the six stops on our tour were the UC Berkeley Research Center, the Belvedere Lookout, the Opunawa Bay, as well as the Opunawa Valley, a famous spot where several television shows and movies have been filmed, as well as archaeology sites where we could see several marae that have been restored. The tour included a photo op at the Papatoa Temple, which is now the site of a Protestant church, and it's the oldest European church in the South Pacific. The tour had us back on the ship by about 12.30, and while some others headed back ashore to do some shopping, we stayed on the ship for the rest of the day, admiring the views. On day three, our port of call was Rayatia. Again, we booked another shore excursion through Windstar Cruises. Here, the main attraction is the Faro River, a critical passageway for the migration of settlers to the region. We opted for the motorized Polynesian Outrigger Canoe Excursion, which also included a beach break at a nearby Mo2. At Rayatia, Star Breeze was actually docked, so we were able to walk off the ship around 8.30 where we met our tour guide, Tihoti, Pierside. A short walk from the ship, we arrived at the transportation for the day and departed for this three and a half hour tour. The motorized outrigger canoe took us along the coast to the bay and the entrance of the Faro River. During the trip, Teodi provided a naturalist perspective of the land, river, and people of French Polynesia. He wanted us to detach from our devices and observe the surroundings. Along the way, Tihoti made sure to point out the indigenous plants. Along with the coconut, chestnut, and breadfruit trees, we also spotted some crustaceans and birds, which call the island home. With the motors off, it was an eerily quiet and surreal experience, drifting along this protected waterway. The river tour lasted about 75 minutes, as the vessel could only go so far up the river, given the depth of the riverbed. Thus, the canoe had to turn around, and we headed out into the lagoon towards a small motu. Exiting the river and then the bay, we headed towards a small motu, which wasn't far away. With a water landing near the sandy shore, we had about an hour to use the beach or just relax in the sun. Similar to the day before, we were back on the vessel around noon. While others did venture back out, we decided to stay on the ship, as that evening was the signature deck barbecue party that we wanted to prepare for. Day four, we stopped at Taha. This port of call offered the least tour options. So it's not surprising that when Star Cruises offers its signature island experience this day. This event took place from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., a small motu nearby the main island. However, we did decide to book an island tour of Taha. Whenever are we gonna to get to see this destination again? Scenic exploration of Taha tour included three stops around the island. We expect to get some narration during the drive, but actually that wasn't the case although we did get some brief presentations at each of the stops. Our first stop was a lookout point. Here we learned more about the island and sampled some fresh fruit. We also learned how to perform the Tahitian signature dance, the tamare. Next was on to Love Here Black Pearl Farm. At the Pearl Farm, we learned about the process of seeding and harvesting the namesake jewel. During the tour, we drove by coastlines that include lush mountains, as well as lagoons and beaches and compared to the other islands, definitely seemed the least developed. The final stop took us to a family-run vanilla plantation. Here, we learned about the tedious task of growing vanilla beans. The plantation owner described the multiple stages it takes to turn this orchid into the flavorful and fragrant bean we all love. With a short drive from the plantation back to the pier, we arrived about 15 minutes late for the tender back to the ship. To get to the private Motu experience, you need to take a Zodiac boat from the ship to the Motu. Finally arriving at the Motu, we're glad we made the voyage. Lounge chairs dotted the coast, and a large pavilion was home to an impressive barbecue display. Similar to the deck party barbecue, the Motu experience included live music and an outdoor barbecue. There were also water sports, a bar, and facilities. First things first, we grabbed some seats and then some food. Among the offerings were seafood skewers, hot dogs, hamburgers, and fish tacos. Needless to say, I didn't go hungry. We spent about two hours walking around the Motu, relaxing beachside, as well as grabbed some drinks and chatted with some newfound friends before taking a Zodiac back to the ship around 3 p.m. This itinerary includes two days in one of the more famous of the French Polynesian islands, Bora Bora. For our first day in Bora Bora, we booked our most exhilarating and adventurous tour of the entire trip, the Bora Bora by four-wheel drive excursion. This excursion had us on one of the first tenders off the ship, 
So we were shoreside by 9.30 a.m. where we met our tour guide, Tiva, for our off-road adventure. With clear skies and beautiful temperatures, the Jeep's top was off and our group of five was ready to see Bora Bora. Now, we've done off-road safari tours before in places like Aruba, but I guess we were not counting on the engineering of the 20th century military. It was an exhilarating ride as we journeyed up the unkept roads forged through the island's steep and rocky landscape. It was quite bumpy and quite fun. Our first stop on the tour was the Bora Bora Antenna Viewpoint. From here, we could see the Lagoon of Bora Bora, as well as the Matera Point, the sharp piece of land that includes the famous Matera Beach. From this vantage point, we could also see the Tape, the main city of Bora Bora, and the Motu Tuapea. It also included an ascent to Mount Popiati, the only 360 degree panoramic viewpoint in Bora Bora. Here, we were able to see the Atoll of Tupai, several of the resorts with overwater bungalows, as well as nearby islands like Taha and Rayatia. Not to mention additional views of the lagoon. We also drove by the famous Bloody Mary's restaurant, stopped at Matira Beach, and visited one of the World War II cannons. At each of the stops, our tour guide provided us with a detailed overview of the island, as well as French Polynesian culture. He was informative, honest, and happy to answer our questions. Not to mention, he was a superb driver. It felt like each off-road adventure was more intense, with the pitch of the roads feeling like the Jeep could topple over at any point. We would highly recommend this tour to get a good overview of Bora Bora. On the second day in Bora Bora, we realized that with most of our vacation almost over, we hadn't purchased any souvenirs from French Polynesia. We decided to do some shopping in Bora Bora. We hopped a tender around 10.30 a.m. We spent a little under two hours walking around the nearby shops and galleries near the pier. We were able to get the obligatory t-shirt and cruise ornament. I guess we expected some of the ports of call to be a bit more touristy with more shops and restaurants. Another reason we took it easy during the day is because that evening was the destination discovery event. We certainly didn't want to miss this Windstar Cruises signature event. We were changed up and ready and on a catamaran to a private motu by 5 p.m. This small sandy island was even nicer than the one we had our beach break on a few days earlier. We were greeted with lays from the officers and a Mai Tai from the bar servers. Now this was my type of destination discovery event. We spent an hour walking around the area. Along the way, we took some photos of the setting sun while enjoying our drinks and chatting with the fellow cruisers. The discovery event included a traditional dinner, which featured tuna with a coconut milk dish, as well as several fresh grilled items like prime rib, seafood, and pork belly. It was an impressive spread. We finished up eating around 645, which did not give us much time between dinner and the show. The main event of the evening was our traditional Tahitian dancers and fire performers. The hour long production was quite impressive. Somehow I even got roped into being part of the show. The show ended around 8 PM and we were all boarded on catamarans for the sail back to the ship. For us, this event was one of the highlights of the trip. Our final port of call was Huahini. As you would expect, we had a tour booked through Windstar Cruises, the sacred sites and legendary places shore excursion. Huahini is one of the more lush islands in the Society Islands, but that's not to say it was completely undeveloped. In fact, the downtown area of Fier, our first stop of the tour, seemed pretty busy. Arriving at the pier around 9 a.m., we met our tour guide, Paul. He was also from California, but had been living in the French Polynesian for over 25 years. Paul held degrees in anthropology and archeology. span He also had a sense of humor and plenty of cultural details. His narration at the various stops offered historical backstory, sprinkled with modern day sensibilities. If visiting Kuahini, we would certainly suggest booking this tour with him. After visiting the island capital, we stopped at a local vanilla plantation. The tour also included a hike up to Matira Hill to see some marae and learn more about pre-Western and post-Western religion, society, and traditions on the islands. While described as a moderate walk, the path was muddy, slippery, and often unmarked, making the climb a bit more difficult than we expected. Additional stops on the tour included a small museum in the Meva village, a stop to feed the blue-eyed eels found only in Huahini, and a photo op at Belvedere Lookout with the ship docked out in Moreau Bay. Now during the drive and the stops, Paul was a great tour guide, very passionate and rather long-winded. So the tour actually went over its scheduled time, which was a fitting end for our exciting and informative seven days sailing the Society Islands. And there you have it. That's our Windstar Cruises Tahiti Cruise Review. 
Do you have any questions for us? Make sure to leave them in the comment section below and we'll be sure to answer them. I'm DB from Eat Sleep Cruise, where I help you see the world one port at a time. And if you enjoyed this video, we have tons of other cruise review and cruise tips videos right here on our channel. You can check out our latest review for the newest mega ship in the world, Wonder of the Seas. We just returned from the seven day inaugural cruise on this world record holder and share all the details with you about the ship's dining, entertainment, and more in our exclusive cruise review video.